Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the first of five presentations on the history of South Brunswick Township. I can't tell you how delighted I am to see you here today. Your response is very generous, and we're very grateful to you that you are as excited about this as we are. My name is Ellen Gambatese, and yes, I am the wife of South Brunswick Township's Deputy Mayor and Councilman Frank Gambatese. And that is what gave birth to the idea of this series in a way because my husband serves on the Historic Preservation Committee. And he kept coming home and telling me about all the wonderful presentations he was seeing and the wonderful people and the knowledgeable people that he was meeting. And the educator in me said, we have to do something about this. We have to make their knowledge available to our township residents on a broader basis. Being a member of the library board, I brought the idea forward to them, and they enthusiastically responded by saying, yes, of course we can do it. So I want to thank the library board. I want to thank Lorraine Jackson, our director, Carl Heffington, our assistant director, who is in the back, because he was especially helpful with working out a lot of the details for us. I would also like to thank the Friends of the Library because they are providing the refreshments for us today. I'd like to thank the Township Administration, especially Ken Kirsch and his department, because when I asked them about videotaping it, there was no problem. They were, they were very happy to do this for us, and eventually you'll see it on Channel 3. In addition, I would like to thank the people who are doing the presenting because they've been a committee with me, and they are just wonderful in giving of their time and their talent. And we wouldn't be here today if it weren't for the people of our community who were so generous. And so, we begin. I will tell you that if you're a note taker like me, there are some little pads on the table that you can make use of. And if you intend to see through the series, and you want to keep whatever we give you, there are some folders on the table, too. One of these is a map drawn by our own Ruth Spataro of South Brunswick Township Outline. <laughs> and another today that we have is an outline of the presentation that our township historian will be presenting. We have three presenters today. The first of whom will be Dr. Joan Lockhart of, King of Dayton. Joan is an anthropologist as well as a historian. She reminds me of a disco ball because every time you look at her, she's throwing off a different light because she is so multi-talented. She's going to be talking to us about our earliest inhabitants and she has some surprises for you. Our next presenter is Mrs. Ruth Spataro, who reminds me of a wonderful trunk full of gracious things <laughs> and wonderful <laughs> memories, because that's Ruth, as stylish as can be, and she's just got this head full of knowledge about our township. And so I see her that way. Seal, our historian, I think you'll agree with me when you hear her, because she reminds me of a bubbling fountain. Every time you talk to Seal, she doesn't give you an answer. She gives you four answers. So you'll, you'll find out for yourself. But she just has all of this history of South Brunswick in her head. And she's going to be sharing it with you today. Before they present, I would just like to do the overview that Ruth, remember Ruth is a retired educator and she's lived in South Brunswick all of her life. And when I told her that today would be an overview session, she did this wonderful chart for us. And those of you who have picked up a map, you'll find it on the back. Um, and if you, don't, you didn't pick it up, you can get one when we break for refreshments. South Brunswick arrives, Ruth said. From 13 to 1399, Indians roamed fields of South Brunswick Township. From 1400 to 1499, in that period of time, 1492, Columbus discovered America. In the 1500s, explorers claimed land for mother countries. 
In the 1600s, the Dutch held first right to New Jersey. In the 1600s. In 1664, New Jersey was taken from the Dutch by England. And in 1666, New Englanders settled in Piscataway. In 1683, proprietors of the East created, East Jersey that is, created Middlesex County. Then in the 1700s, 1730, this way, received a charter from King George III. In 1763, the second royal charter by King George uh, III was established, and that created the north and south wards of the city of New Brunswick, 1763. In 1798, by legislative action, the inhabitants of the South Ward of New Brunswick shall be known by the name of the inhabitants of the Township of South Brunswick in the County of Middlesex. And that's what gave birth to South Brunswick. And you remember we celebrated our bicentennial in 1998. Mm-hmm. <laughs> that's right. So I'll just tell you before I, inter before I let Dr. Luckhart take over, that our presentation today will be Dr. Luckhart and then Ruth Spataro, and then we'll break for refreshments, and then Seal Leadham, our historian, will present for the third presentation. All right? Enjoy it all, folks. Not yet. No. For the, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. For the video folks, I'm going to be um, turning the lamp on. Is that going to be a problem for you? Or should I wait? If I turn the fan on, is that going to ruin the sound? It's okay. All right. This is a map of, uh, that the Dutch made of tribes that they encountered as they uh, went up and down around the, uh, uh, what we now know as New Jersey. And it, what you'll note is that particularly along the Delaware where they were most able to gather information, that there were many, many tribes, but all of the tribes from New York all the way uh, through eastern Pennsylvania and through Delaware came to be called the Delaware Indians. But typically they would be groups and bands of Indians. But those were the Indians that uh, Europeans encountered uh, somewhere around the 1600s. But they would have, uh, they were a group uh, of linguistically known as the Algonquin speaking tribes. But prior to that, you, there would have been tribes uh, prior to European contact. Going back as far as uh, some researchers argue, uh, 12,000 years ago, or perhaps earlier, depending on, uh, but certainly uh, 12,000 years ago, there were tribes here. But the tribes the Europeans encountered spoke um, were, you can see some of the uh, various tribes uh, are now named, place names are named after them. They break into a couple of basic language uh, groups. They would have called themselves the Lenape, or as the Swedes called them, uh, tried to call them the Renape, which is so something like that. And the northern half spoke a dialect called Munsee, and the southern, this would have been uh, from the Raritan north, 
up through Rockland uh, County uh, and over to Eastport, uh, no, it, well, over to Allentown area. And then down from the Raritan South, there would have been groups that were Yanami speakers. But they saw themselves differently. They saw themselves as uh, the translation of Lenape, which would be the people. We're just folks here. And you will find almost all tribal people across the United States, when you ask them what they call themselves, call themselves what in their language would translate as the people. Um, Inuit, for example, we know as the Eskimo, but Inuit means the people. Um, and I can go on and on tribe after tribe. They then would be called by Europeans often what the place name where they gave a place a name for themselves. But one of the things that happens over time <coughs> is that they disperse in, in New Jersey and are split up. The reason that they are split up is because they die, about 90 percent die of diseases. They were, they had, uh, were Asian in background. They had come to the New World uh, thousands of years prior to European arrival. So they had very little resistance to European diseases, such as measles or uh, smallpox. And they would die in waves of uh, almost every 20 years. So current research suggests that about 90% on the, of tribal folks along the eastern seaboard died of smallpox and measles prior to large settlements of Europeans. After the settlements of Europeans, it became a contest of, of over land. But in the southern half of the state, what we find is because of Quakers, who we will hear more about settlement, uh, they paid for the land often. They purchased the land. In the northern half, where you have uh, more of Scottish settlements, there was still some payment for land although with the Dutch and the, uh, there was a different viewpoint on tribal folks. Uh, later, in about the 1750s, there's an uh, effort to, Christ to uh, convert the tribes to Christianity. Uh, in the Allentown area, you have the Moravians who begin to uh, convert the tribes, and the Brotherton uh, reserve is put down in what we call Indian Mills, New Jersey today. Why is that important? Because many of the Christian Indians did not go west. They came back to South Brunswick. They had uh, fields and were agriculturalists. And so they began to settle in to live among the Europeans and to intermarry uh, among the tribes. Uh, with the Europeans. But the Delaware left South Brunswick as tribal people and first ended up in Ohio. They ended up in, well, they ended up in Pennsylvania for a while. Then they ended up in uh, Kansas, Wisconsin, Indiana. And then finally, there's a larger group of them today uh, in Oklahoma where they uh, purchased land among the Cherokee and the Cherokee Reserve in Oklahoma where they settled. Um, that was their legacy. Now there's probably around 16,000 <coughs> Delaware today and I noticed from the latest census there are 48 tribal people living in, or American Indians living in South Brunswick. So some of the Delaware actually have returned <coughs> to South Brunswick uh, having had a a very circuitous journey to get here. But uh, they are, in fact, I'm going to show some slides of some of the, the way they would have uh, used the environment around them, including South, the, that of South Brunswick. So I'm going to do a little bit. Turn off this. this. And I'm going to next turn the uh, lights off 
in the front. So just be prepared. I may turn out the wrong ones. OK. They would have been uh, tribal people collecting uh, natural products to em embellish and to beautify their world. They also uh, generally were matrilineal. In other words, they, most of our, our, when we take a name as a child, we take the name of our father usually in the United States, uh, although things do change. And we sometimes take both parents' names. But in their uh, organizational structure, they would have seen themselves as members of their mother's lineage. And typically, they would have been divided into two or three uh, divisions, uh, the wolf, the turtle, um, and the turkey. Um, as Ben Franklin wanted to make it our national bird, there is a reason they're very bright birds. Uh, they would have dressed in hide clothing, or in some cases, woven bark, or you know, so like mats. But this is birch bark. And uh, typically, they would have, in the northern areas, used more birch bark uh, than in southern areas, because in the northernmost areas, the birch bark bark gets very thick. It's about a quarter of an inch thick, and can be used for many uh, products. The decoration you see are quills from porcupines. And porcupines were ubiquitous. Uh, and, uh, and so they were easy. Uh, as one, When the tribal people I lived with said, in order to get quills, you throw a sponge at a porcupine. <laughs> <laughs> and then they release all the quills, and you have your quills for decoration. They're colored with uh, vegetable dye, historically. And then uh, they're stuck into the birch bark in various patterns. You just take a bone awl or a metal awl today, and you would stick the end of the quills in. These are actually made by the Mi'kmaq, who are Algonquin speakers of nor the uh, Canadian United States border. And the nice thing about birch bark is it, tip it doesn't uh, break. You can move it a bit. Now, most of the Algonquins in South Brunswick, or the Lenape in South Brunswick, would have been agriculturalists, growing corn, squash, and beans, and uh, doing hunting. They would do some canoeing. Uh, they would use uh, various types of boats uh, to go up and down the rivers, uh, canoes to go up and down the rivers. And they would have worn hide clothing. Now, when they met Europeans, uh, they particularly, some of them, uh, designed their clothing after the European styles that they saw. And in this case, you'll see that there's uh, lapels, there's uh, pockets are decorated, and the beads were trade beads. In fact, New Jersey was noted for selling, making wampum. The Europeans made wampum uh, out of, uh, uh, it's a shellfish you get on the ocean, and the Europeans cranked it out to trade with the Indians because the Indians prized the quahog shell beads. But these are various small, very small glass beads. And you can see those would be in a particularly curvilinear design, unlike that of Western tribes who used more geometric designs. And what you'll find is the uh, designs, again, are curvilinear. And they particularly like the blues, the reds, and the white. Again, you'll notice the curvilinear design. And this is the lapel of the jacket. Now, before they had beads, they used the quills. You saw the first pieces that were quills where they were rounded. Well, these are actually quills where they flattened the quills. They did the colors, uh, porcupine quills, uh, which you can see on the table later, um, are usually kind of white with two brown ends at either end. And they'll take color because they're, they're hollow. And you usually use vegetable dyes to color them. And you flatten them to get this effect. 
Those are flattened quills that were used for decoration prior to uh, trading for European beads. Again, you'll notice the curvilinear flower designs, much different than those that you find in the West. And this is a headdress. In the Delaware typically use turbans as one of their uh, chief's identification. Now why I, I, I really, it's, uh, my assumption is it was a European uh, adaptation. But it looked like a Turkish towel with a tassel on it. Um, again, the, uh, these are moccasins. They would have been made out of hide, decorated in this case with, uh, with beads, but uh, quills prior to that. When they used the beads, they usually would put a flap of the decoration on the top of, the sh of, of what was already sewn, because when the sh moccasin wore out, they could take the decoration off and sew it onto a new moccasin. Again, curved lines. And this is a bandolero that would have been worn over the jacket. And a medicine bag. A medicine bag was very powerful for each individual tribal person and certainly for um, a person that was um, a medicine person, a medicine man. But a, tr a person would keep their medicine bag and they would have such thing as their umbilical cord in it. And they would keep uh, powerful I I idols or icons for themselves in that bag. Their religion typically would be, be prior to Christ, adopting Christianity, as many of the tribes did, uh, was uh, a belief in all living things have life. Trees, rocks, animals. And they often viewed themselves as having a kinship with a particular group of animals. When Europeans came, they traded or made items for trade such as these bags uh, and decoration. And again, curvilinear items. But because of our view of tribal people, what we often did to Eastern, the Delaware and other uh, Eastern Indians was to insist when they did live among us uh, that we dress up as Western Indians because we, as Europeans came to view tribal people, that they ought to look like the folks who lived out in the West. And in this case, these are uh, Eastern Algonquin Indians dressed up for postcard picture taking as if they were Sioux Indians. And uh, gone are the uh, curvilinear designs and the turbans. Now, let me. Uh, turn the lights back on and just hold up some of the items I have, which you're welcome to view afterwards. Oh, great. Thank you. Um, this is a uh, birch bark uh, moose collar, which you wouldn't have necessarily had moose calls down here. But you'll see the birch bark on the inside and the decoration on the outside. This is called spring bark often used to make the um, bark was often used to make the outside of their houses or their wigwams which were sticks with uh, bark over top and sometimes they lived a good portion of a year in one location so they were not um, nomads in this in a strict sense they were seasonally changing location within South Brunswick but typically were farmers The canoe was a very powerful and potent force. This one happens to be a birch bark canoe. Um, it would have been built with uh, similar items to it, but with a stronger number of ribs on the inside. You're welcome to take a look at that later. Birch bark then became a tourist industry item. This is an old uh, not, turn of the century, turn of the 1900s. Uh, picture frame out of birch bark 
with quill work des uh, decoration. Tobacco was a very important, I know we've all quit smoking, but there, tobacco was extremely important to American Indians and still is. It was used not often, but uh, as a, uh, this was is a it was piece of Indian tobacco in the way they would have turned it. And they would have used pieces of it in ritual ceremonies and in friendship uh, ceremonies. Baskets were very important because they don't get broken, although uh, the tribal people living in South Brunswick would have made some pottery. Um, this is an oak uh, uh, rush made out of ash, and all these baskets are made out of either what they call, uh, uh, this is a grass, sweet grass handle, sweet grass woven in large plaits like and then woven among the ash. It was like an air freshener. You wet it and it has a wonderful odor. But the, this was, um, you can see the ash ends up being sort of golden color. But it would have at one time held a vegetable dye color that fades over time. The ash it only grows in certain uh, rocky areas on upland hills and is pri was prized as having very silky and, uh, strips that they would have had to peel down to make use out of. This is my attempt at quill work, and I'll, I'll close with that. This is a hair piece that would have been, um, it's not unusual to find tribal people wearing these today, although not as crudely made. Uh, this is quill work combined with bead work uh, and leather over the birch bark. Uh, very uh, time consuming to go get the porcupine quills. <laughs> <laughs> uh, although today, because of roadkill, you do have a better chance at getting, <laughs> getting a bit of it. <laughs> and um, so these are kind of the kind of things that they would have used in their daily environment to go out and collect what nature has, pr has provided and finding a way to use it. So the uh, next speaker will probably go into the trails that they cut through off South Brunswick. Uh, I should just mention two areas of South Brunswick which we know tribal people uh, inhabited. That would have been over but the Indian Field School area. Uh, and there is uh, even said to have been a skirmish there and during the revolutionary, around the Revolutionary War that included tribal people. And then down in Day Road and Broadway, uh, Frank Porter, who uh, did a lot of research on uh, the, the Delaware tribes, uh, noted that down in that area there were large portions that were considered Indian fields because the tribal people worked them as agriculturalists. So thank you very much. This is the first time I ever been with a speaker, so I don't know how I'm going to make out on this. <laughs> next, on the, next on the menu is a taste of history. After the history stories, it will be sip of tea time. Always something to look forward to. Today is an overview of the long ago South Brunswick. Please remember there are four coming attractions, Kingston on April the 8th, Dayton Deans on April the 22nd, Mammoth Junction, May the 6th, and on June the 3rd, last but not least, the newest member of the group. Who's that? Kendall Park. You're right, Kendall Park. <laughs> <laughs> um, this flyer um, is a recap of things you'll hear today. So you can take it home and, um, I mean, you want to check on something, see the stages that, growth stages that South Brunswick went through, you probably can find the answer in that. Mm -hmm. Centuries ago, 
the Indians, the, our forests and our fields and our streams provided food, clothing, and shelter for the, our first inhabitants, the American Indians. Now, as they traveled across the land, their path became the leading roadways of South Brunswick today. Now, very, very quick, you're going to get, I'm going to take you on a journey of Route 27, Route 1, Ridge Road, George's Road, and the Cranberry South River Road. And believe it or not, here's a, here's a pointer with an Indian on. Uh, this came from one of the camps out west. I got it. Some teacher went on a vacation and brought it back to me about 40 years ago. So, <laughs> but it's still one. Um, this, I have to keep my eyes on this because I, I probably won't say. This is high, Highway 27. Today, in past, it was called the Lincoln Highway, Old Post Road, or the King's Highway. It was, a, it was a very busy route in the 1700s. It went from Philadelphia to New York. In 1917, then the state took over uh, taking care of Route 27. This is Route 1. The, Route 1 was a path of the Indians between Trenton and New Brunswick. In 1804, the New Brunswick Trenton Turnpike Organization uh, got this land somehow, and they made a toll road of it. It, uh, it prospered until the first of this century, and then they just walked away from it, and the, uh, the counties and the um, township, the county, and the township that went through um, had to bear the responsibility of it. They, they, they were left a white elephant. Now, here, here is a picture you're going to look at. Here is um, Route 1 in the year 1904. And these three men here, you can, you can look at this picture later. These three men here are the road crew from South Brunswick taking care of Route 1. Now, my recollection of Route 1 is when you went to the, um, the end of Ridge Road and you, you went left, you went to Trenton. And if you turn right, it was a beautiful scene. It was, it was a winding dirt road with lush trees on each side. And I was a little girl then, and you know, um, it seemed to go up to the sky. It was so high. Right now, uh, Sand Hills is the highest point in Middlesex County. So you can remember then how high it was before it cut down. Well, what did I find when I got up there? I, there were men and men and men with black and white suits on, cracking rocks. And I learned that they were prisoners from the world, uh, First World War. I don't. I don't know from what country they were, but that's my recollection of Route 1. Well, in, 19, in 1927, the state took over Route 1. In 1930, they had finished it in its entirety, and it went from Trenton to Jersey City, and it was called the Superhighway Route 1. Now, that road runs 2,467 miles from Maine to Florida. Um, let's see, the next trip always, oh, this is Ridge Road. Well, now, story goes that I have. That road used to be walked by Barefoot Bronson. He was a man from Kingston. <laughs> And he owned a lot of property here somewhere, and he would travel this road to Cross Road, which is now Dayton, and then to on to Road Hall. And I don't know if he, 
he probably would take the record for having the toughest feet if he, if he really did travel in his bare feet. I often wondered that. But in 19, in 19, no, in 1727, uh, the records show that it was called Ridge Road. Now we're on George's Road. For a long time, I thought George's Road was named after King George, but he wasn't. It wasn't. It was named after George Resurrect. He bought 300 acres in Cranberry on an Indian trail. He built a tavern with food, and his tavern also had entertainment. So George was way ahead of himself, I guess, in this case. <laughs> <laughs> and um, when the land transfer happened in 1725, um, on, on the contract, it read, George's Road from New Brunswick to Cranberry. And that's how George's Road got its name. Now the South River Road, that, <coughs> look, I'm going to get my dates mixed up on this. Let me check this out here now. <laughs> oh, where did, oh, they put them over here. There's two dates on here that I'm not going to, re I'm not going to remember too well. In 1680s, in South River Road was a very busy road, first by foot and first by horses and then by stagecoach. In 1686, Perth Amboy was the capital of the East Province. And in 1702, Burlington was the capital of the West Province. So there was a lot of travel between those two government headquarters and as it was busy then, as you know, the South River Road is, is just as busy today. Um, let's see, no, we have a right. Wait a minute. Yeah, that's the South River. So, um, that's, that's, I have taken now the five, the five roads. Now, the early travelers followed the Indian paths to, you know, go to distant places. But um, the trips, the trips were really hard. The trips were really long and hard for these people that walked. So that's the reason colonial taverns first appeared. Uh, later on, when horses came and in view and the stage coaches, stables were built to house the animals. And where a tavern was built, very soon a community would be grow up. As the community grew, the need to educate children became very apparent. And the first children were taught at home, and the um, and then they would a few would go to a neighbor's house. And later on, the one-room schools would appear. Now, um, there were 13 one-room schools. The, the first one were on the busy traveling road, Kingston, Road Hall, and Fresh Ponds is where the earliest schools were built. The next group was Ridge Road, Franklin Township, Mapleton, and Scotts Corner. In the 1850s, Little Rocky Hill, Pleasant Hill, um, and Dayton. 1887 was Sand Hills, and the last one room school that was built was Mammoth Junction. Now, Dayton, Dayton had a cute story about their first one-room school. Uh, the Janesburg and Freehold Agriculture Railroad uh, were building a railroad track, and the school was right in the middle of it. The people of Dayton were very concerned, and they didn't want the school touched, but they had a diplomat deal with them. and so. 
Mr. Dayton told them that the railroad company would build them a new school if they could have that land. And that's what happened. So they built a new school in 1863, and in, uh, it was in 19 that they added two rooms, um, two rooms to this school. So then Dayton had a four-room school. But just think what would have happened if they let that old school be where it was. Anyone have an idea? Well, it would be right in the middle of the way of the Mom Railroad track now. <laughs> and for the historical society, it would say keep it there. But we lost that on that one. <laughs> Um, the first school in Deans, too, had its story. That was built in the middle of the intersection of George's Road and Pigeon Swamp Road. Well, after the Revolutionary War, they thought that it would, the schoolhouse was blocking the road. So Mr. McDowell uh, offered a plot of land to build a new school. So they built a new school on George's Road. But then after a while, they widened George's Road. So the school was so close to the road. So after the Civil War, they had to build a new school back on the, further back on the same site. And um, in that school, the, first, the one room school, it would be the third one in Deans, they added the second room. Remember, remember the second room that they added to Dean's school. I want to show. Um, I'll show you something now. Now we come to the old Ridge School. Do you want to put uh, the old Ridge School? My mother taught in this school when she was a young girl. Um, thank you. This picture was taken in 1906. She lived in the center of Monmouth Junction, and she rode a bicycle up Ridge Road. And when she got there, she'd have to make the fire and go to the next uh, the farmhouse close by and get water for the old stone water crock. And they would have to sweep the floor. And the thing I remember most of all, she said, they cut the pencils in half to make them last longer. Mm -hmm. And. Um, when, after I was born, why she used to sub, she used to substitute. So once in a while, I would go substituting with him. The one trip I remember, we had a car. I remember they called it an old boat, and I thought it was a Mitchell. I don't know, maybe, I don't know what kind of car that was. But anyway, the car Mitchell stopped, and she was frantic. How were we going to get the fresh pond for her to substitute? And pretty soon I heard coming down the road, clack, 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 and there was a log wagon. So we both got on the log wagon and ended up in school. I don't know how I got home, though. <laughs> now, in 1851, the privately operated schools gave way to the public school system. And the township set aside $600 for the operation of those 13 schools for <laughs> one year. <laughs> now listen to this. 150 years later, we're setting aside $89,700,000. So that's how times have changed. And in 1891, all the property within South Brunswick Territory was designated as Middlesex County School District 77. Now, so remember, we're up to 13 schools now. Um, I'm leaving schools for a few seconds, and I'm going to talk about property. Oh, that's right. I need the other map now. <laughs> Thank you. All right, and as you see, this outline, this was South Brunswick in 1798 when we, you know, when it was first declared a township. It was 68 square miles with 44,160 acres. 
Now, in 1872, and again in 1885, Cranberry was awarded some of our property, 13 and a half square miles. And then in 1914, Plainsburg was given 12 square miles. So by that, we had lost 37% of our property. South Brunswick lost 16,640 acres. And instead of 68 square miles, we are now 42.5 square miles. Instead of 44,160 acres, we have 27,520 acres. But there's no use crying over spilt milk. <laughs> but if, per, if Plainsboro didn't get that new land, we could have taken care of Route 92 without any trouble at all. <laughs> Well, now when, now when uh, that land disappeared, well, um, the school, this school, and that Scott school went to Plainsboro School. So two, we lost two of our schools. Pleasant Hill was demolished, so we lost another school. Um, Road Hall, Road Hall went to Dayton. Um, Fresh Ponds pupils went to Dean's school. Remember that, that two-room school they had? Uh, let's see. Sand Hills went to Monmouth Junction. Little Rocky Hill went to Kingston. And Ridge went to the New Ridge School. There was a New Ridge School built in 1913, so they were still using that. And so, little by little, the 13-room school started to disappear. Now we're coming to a new era. We're coming to an era where Dayton had four-room school because they built two rooms on top of that school that the railroad built for them. So they had the nice four-room school. Dean still had the two-room school. But the majority of board members at that time lived in Dayton. And they decided that Dayton needed a school, new school. Well, you can imagine how that went over with Dean's. When they heard it there, the PTA organized, and soon those board members learned that, well, it would be two schools or none. That's the reason you see the two schools in similar architecture form over in Dayton. Um, election day came, and with it came a snowstorm. It's a snowstorm like the likes that most of you, have, I don't believe, have ever seen. It was really, travel was impossible, but somehow, the election board members got out to their place in the Dayton School, and they were the only ones that showed up, and the election board members voted those two schools in. <laughs> so that's the reason. And, um, and um, I mean, it was, it was really uh, a good idea because, take a look at this ad. This is the school that Dean's had. I mean, and you said, now pupils will have all modern conveniences, replacing one without lights and running water. And so that's, that's the, um, and another thing that those schools did wonders for this township. It was the first time we really had any auditorium space. And they brought the community together. Um, for years, every weekend, uh, one PTA or the other would hold a card party and a dance. And it was a real bargain when you come to think of it. I um, mean, and, and you can't imagine it happening nowadays. Uh, the, young, the young people had the dancing part, and out in the corridors out there would be the card tables, and uh, always a lot of prizes for the best card players. And then when the prizes were all given out, they'd all rush into the cafeteria for refreshment, free. Uh, they were homemade sandwiches. And um, it was a big drawing card for a year. But it was wonderful because it brought the, the township together. We were like little isolated parks 
uh, pockets until that point. So now we have come from zero schools. We, were, we started with zero schools when the, you know, the first little schoolhouse was built. Up, we traveled up 13, and we came back to four. Now, um, but right now, we have Brunswick Acres, Cambridge and Constable, Dayton Deans, and the new one in the works, Deans Pine School, Greenbrook, Indian Field, Monmouth Junction, Crossroad North, Crossroad South, and the new high school. And I bet it won't be long before we'll have a baker's dozen again. <laughs> Zeman is passing out to you now a paper that has Zeal Leadham's outline on it. And it's what she's going to talk about because I told you Zeal has lots of answers and we wanted to make sure that you didn't miss anything and we also wanted to make something available to you that if you wanted to make notations, you could do it at that point in her talk. Um, is there anything else I'm supposed to be telling you? I don't think so. Okay. Seal has been working very hard to narrow down the amount of information that she's presenting to you because she wants to tell you everything. And we said, no, Seal, you can't do that. <laughs> so she has been working really diligently. Every time she sees me, she says, I got it down to this, I got it down to that. So I, uh, but it's just that there is a lot to our history. Were you surprised by anything? Did anybody learn anything today? Oh, good, because that makes me very happy. As an educator, that makes me happy. So I'll just take a minute to tell you that our next presentation is on April 8th, and it will focus on the Kingston area of South Brunswick. And I can't tell you what the program consists of because I like surprises. But I can tell you that our presenters will be Ann Zeman, who is here with us today, a jack of all everything, and Dr. Robert Van Zumbush, who is sitting here He's going to be helping with that program, too. And it's going to be another very informative, very enjoyable presentation. So now I welcome the opportunity to give you our township historian, Seal Leadham. Good afternoon. My name is Seal Leadham. I want to talk about South Brunswick today. That's our topic. And I would like to start out by saying every community has its own unique history. I believe the phrase location, location, location very aptly explains South Brunswick's development. And you'll see why as I continue on with this presentation. Like you or your families before you, early settlers came to make a better life. I chose this image because I wanted you to get a feel for what I I think it was like when our first settlers came to this community and from most places in New Jersey. They came on very narrow dirt roads. They were probably lucky if they had a wagon with some ox to pull it. They didn't have a lot of money necessarily and shoes were quite a luxury too. Although I imagine when they came over on the boats originally they did have some type of shoes. Travel conditions did not improve very much until the 1800s. Villages, of course, as we know, developed around the needs of travelers and the settlers who gravitated to these early outposts. For much of the township's early history, activities revolved around agriculture. This quote from a traveler in the late 1600s will illustrate our old trails. It is on. Okay, I'll try to speak a little louder. Do you hear me now? Okay. Jasper Dankerts, a Dutch traveler in 1679, on his trip down the Indian Trail we call the Assunpink Trail, which was along the original Route 27, he said, it's a very steep, a very shrubby road, and you must dismount in order to lead your horses down carefully. We rode a little further and came to the Millstone River again, which runs so crookedly. So 
this picture kind of demonstrates that the roads were small and narrow, and travel was very difficult. Next, I want to start with a little history lesson, a little review. South Brunswick is 42 square miles now. And as you can see here, this is Middlesex County, and South Brunswick is down here in the southwestern corner. I, wanted, I thought it might be helpful if you saw that where South Brunswick is in relationship to the townships around us. So North Brunswick is here, East Brunswick over here, Monroe Township on our east side, Cranberry below, Plainsboro, and then this is Franklin Township. Then, because so much of our history is based on location, I wanted to emphasize the fact that New York is north of us and Philadelphia is south of us, and here we sit right in the middle. This area right here is often referred to as the waste of New Jersey. W-A-I-S-T, yes. <laughs> no, no, I didn't, never even thought about the waste, the other one. <laughs> and so much of northern New Jersey is, is centered around New York, and that's their hub. And then the South Jersey's hub is basically Philadelphia. And here we sit right in the middle. Continuing on our geography lesson, this was a little, I hope it's not too confusing for you. But I thought it was nice. There's a lot of waterways around South Brunswick, and you might have passed them and crossed them and not really known what they were called. Of course, we know that Millstone River is right down here in Kingston where the mill is. Then we have Heathcote Brook, which comes up through this, these developments along Raymond Road and actually crosses Route 1. Further up, we have Oakey's Brook, which is up here in Brunswick Acres. And it, forms part of our borderline with North Brunswick. Then we, it comes down here at some point and joins Ireland Brook. I believe it's named for a man named Ireland. That forms our borderline with uh, probably East Brunswick. Uh, in the middle, we have a, a lovely name called Devil's Brook. And another one on the southeastern side called Shallow Brook. But one of the significant things is the Lawrence Brook. The Lawrence Brook. Um, has its headwaters in the Mama Junction area and flows north up to the Raritan River. Uh, if you see this green line here, this sort of separates South Brunswick. South Brunswick is in what's called two different watersheds. What that means is water to the north of this line flows north toward the Raritan, and it's called the Lawrence Brook watershed, and water to the south of this line flows south toward the Millstone, and it's called the Millstone watershed. And I just thought that would be interesting for you to know those, those pieces of information about South Brunswick. Oh, one little thing I wanted to point out involving my next slide is Pigeon Swamp. How many of you have heard of Pigeon Swamp? OK, that's well, you're pretty well informed. <laughs> we, are, we are fortunate in some ways today to have Pigeon Swamp in the northeast part of our township. This is an area of extreme wetlands, and it's in a state of preservation by the state now because about 1,000 acres are part of a Pigeon Swamp State Park, which is sort of undeveloped, and that's probably the way we'd like to keep it for a while. What I have here is a page from the Pigeon Swamp Ledger Book. It is significant in our early history because three local residents, John Wetherill, David Williamson, and James Gulick, petitioned the State Assembly in 1779 for permission to collect payments to maintain the drainage for the swampy area. Uh, they were granted this privilege because at that time, during the Revolutionary War, they were looking for all the acreage they could for growing crops and feeding cattle, whatever they needed to do, for extra land. 
they, apparently a great ditch had already been dug out toward the Lawrence Brook, and three acts of the legislature in 1780, 1835, and 1892 continued this work. We are fortunate to have in the library this Pigeon Swamp ledger book. And I have this page here, and we have the bottom of the signatures of David Williamson, John Van Dyke, and John Davidson on the bottom here. They were some of the early, first early um, collectors for this payment. And getting back to the early times in South Brunswick, this map shows, let's see if I'm going to get this straightened. Up here are towns, it's a little bit of an angle. I wanted to talk about the early land grants. Um, Peter Somans was a proprietor for East Jersey. We, and then we talked about, mentioned East and West Jersey. The original proprietors, two men, uh, eventually um, passed on. And the, the, uh, at one point, they decided they had to divide New Jersey into two sections. And so they made it East and West. And we're mostly in the East. But uh, they had a division line. They couldn't decide on just where to put it. And it kept getting shifted further north. So most of more South Brunswick kept getting in the west part of New Jersey. It's a, it's a thing of importance now when you're researching old deeds. Anyway, Peter Solman was one of these proprietors. And as part of their investment, they got a certain amount of land grants. And he, this red striped section is through most of uh, western and central South Brunswick. He had 15,000 acres, of which this is a part. And he got that grant of land in 1693. Another portion, this green tract right here, it was called the Harrison Tract. And this is a family named Harrison that had a, a large number of acres, 10,000 or more, over in the Franklin Township in South Brunswick areas. And this area mostly covers Kendall Park today. These larger tracts were gradually sold off into smaller sections. And so I wanted to say here that this section right here that I have in the blue was uh, first sold by Peter Solomons to a man named Thomas Lawrence. Thomas Lawrence was actually a Philadelphia merchant who later became a mayor of Philadelphia. So he was probably buying land partly for speculation and to see what would happen with it. Um, next, he sold his land to the Roland family. And later on, it became what most of the land from Monmouth Junction. So you have some feeling now of a background for the, owner, the ownership path of that land in Monmouth Junction. Another family was Johnson. Johnson was actually a, a corruption of the Dutch name Jansen. He came down in about 1728, and his land is referred to as three miles east of Kingston. And that's because there was no Monmouth Junction back then. Um, then he lived there about 100 years. and ended up selling the property to the Stouts. The Stout family of Monmouth Junction lived there about 100 years. And now part of their property is right around where the new high school is located. Other, old la other landholders were Mr. Matthias Van Dyke in Kingston. He owned about 2,000 acres along the millstone. The John Weatherall I mentioned with Pigeon Swamp, he had 1,700 acres over in the Dayton area that extended pretty much up to the, uh, the borderline here by the Turnpike, 8A. And then Andrew McDowell bought 750 acres up here in the Dean's area. One of the things I wanted to point out about these early settlers is their Dutch and English names. Because the Dutch were the first settlers in this area, names like Van Dyke, Beekman, Terhune, Wyckoff, Voorhees and then the Jansen, which was turned into Johnson, represent the Dutch settlers who came to the area. And then we have Woods. The, the, there's a Woods Tavern up on Route 27, which is now Baroud Realty. It was an early tavern along that road. And Wetherill, and the name Withington, which is in Kingston. And then right along in here, where I have this name Williamson, in 1730, one of our first innkeepers came along the area from Scotland, and he established an inn in an area we call Road Hall. And other names came from the French Huguenots like Perrine, Cordelou, and Roland.
Now we're going on to the, the section I like to talk about where the travelers and settlers finally came to rest here in South Brunswick. This is a picture of David Williamson, that man I said was living over in Road Hall. This is a picture of his inn taken about 100 years ago. It was on Cranberry Road, and the road that Ruth referred to, that was that busy road between um, Perth Amboy and Burlington. So we had travelers coming down between Burlington and Perth Amboy, using inns like this for rest. They were called, some called taverns, ordinaries, or public houses. Kingston had them with names like, run by the Van Tilburg family, a Dutch name, and the Withington family, which is an English name. Dayton had Whitlock Bericklow Inn, built in around 1730. And that building now is Dayton Diner, probably the oldest building in Dayton. Other inns and hotels, one called the Wines Hotel, built around 1770, was right across from the Dayton Diner, but it's now the site of the Wawa. <laughs> Many things burnt down and some things were torn down. So that this community you see today is not necessarily how things looked 100 years ago. Uh, travelers, as the most, most popular road was the one, of course, coming from New Brunswick through Kingston and Princeton down to Trenton. People were always in a hurry to get from one place to the other. But these inns and public houses also served the local residents. They were places for meetings, social events, news, political discussions, law courts, and some entertainment on two. I have just a quick overhead showing an interior of an inn taken. It was a, there was a German painter who came to America named Kreml, and he did a lot of um, scenes around the, the colonial period. And this is an inn scene, so you can see them. They're gathering together there, having a little drink. People are coming in. It's a, it's a gathering place for the community and for travelers. Many of you may have seen this picture before. This is... Um, part of my section talking about early businesses that would come to a, the, these colonial early settlers into our communities. In order to get flour, they needed to grind the grain. So grist mills were a very early establishment in most, most local areas, the, the community farming areas that developed. They needed the grist mills for wheat, oats, barley, rye, and corn. Now, of course, they early uh, early settlers in America did learn to grow things from the Indians. We talked about the beans and the corn and the squash, but they were mostly Europeans and they were used to a, a diet based on flour products. And so these grist mills solved their dilemma for getting their, gr their grain ground. There were other mills. This was on the Lawrence Brook. Um, have any of you been to Davidson's Mill Pond Park? This is a wonderful place you all ought to go to off of Riva Avenue. And it's the site of where this mill was located. It was probably not the first mill, but it's one of several that were built along the Lawrence Brook. Others were in Dean's, in George's Road, which were just between, George's, uh, just between Dean's and Dayton. The Lawrence Brook crosses over George's Road, and there was, a, there was a pond that's all dried up now, but it was owned by the Dean's family, and they have also built mills there. They had the Dean's Grist Mill, and they had a Dean's Saw Mill. Mills were built in Kingston in the early 1700s. Again, the big red mill we see was probably not the first one on that site. Just like this was probably not the first one on this site. This, the first mill here was built around 1730 by a man named William Cox, and it changed, went into the Van Pelt family and had various owners until it burnt down, I believe, in the 1950s. Other early businesses were like blacksmiths, wheelwrights, carpenters, tanners, weavers, tailors, distillers. There were over 100 different businesses that listed on old wills from the, in the 16 to the 1700s. So even though people were farmers, there were many other occupations around that served the farming needs as well as the needs of villagers and travelers. 
Distilleries often specialize in apple cider. Uh, it may have come hard. That was probably pleased some people too. <laughs> Um, it, was, it was one of the most popular drinks because they never really felt that water was an appropriate beverage. And considering where they got their water, uh, it, it wasn't, they didn't necessarily have the kind of facilities we have today. It was probably safer to drink the apple cider. I have this little image here to show you about the hard work that our early settlers did. They had fields to plow, fields to woods and timber to clear and cut down. They built fences to keep the animals from wandering around. And here's, here's they're putting up fences, and they had to manually cut the grain for their crops. Women worked too. They had large families because while the land was relatively cheap in, in the colonies, labor was very expensive. So large families were important. Every hand was needed. Women worked uh, probably uh, not only in the house, but they, a lot of times women were in charge of the gardens for the, fam for the everyday family food needs. <coughs> but they did have time for fun. Some mixed work with pleasure in activities called frolics. Whole families would participate in these activities where they would go to somebody else's house. Uh, they might be building a house or raising a barn, corn husking, har uh, harvesting crops, or have you heard of quilting bee? It's the same kind of thing as a frolic here. But, but a more, it was more of a family activity. The men would get together and talk if they weren't doing something. Or if they were building something, the women would be in charge of cooking the meals in the evening time. Other activities in colonial times, I think they've even existed in the Kingston area, were horse racing, lotteries, and drinking. <laughs> I believe the horse racing and the lotteries and the drinking were probably men's activities, but one can't be sure. <clears throat> Before we go on to our next section, I wanted to mention some of the act the um, Encounters we have with the Revolutionary War in South Brunswick. We had twice uh, Continental troops came through South Brunswick. Once in 1777, after the Battle of Princeton, the uh, troops marched north through Kingston, up that long, difficult hill, because it was a lot, I hear it was a lot higher at the time, and they rested briefly, and the generals conferred to decide instead of going on to New Brunswick on Route 27 like they had planned, they made a detour off to Grigstown and they went north that way. They, they went that way, they escaped the pursuers, they also did a little damage to the bridge in hopes that that would delay them a little bit too. And they fooled the British. The British went on Route 27 and missed them completely. About a year later, in June of 1778, they came again this way through Kingston. They marched through Kingston, a long ridge road, stopped briefly at what was Longbridge Farm. And I believe I, if you see this map here, this is showing the route through Kingston, a Longbridge Road. Um, and Longbridge Farm was believed to be actually right um, almost in, in, in Monmouth Junction. There's an old house there that they believe might be that, the site. They camped, camped there briefly, and they continued on their way toward Cranberry in the Battle of Monmouth, which was uh, again in June of 1778. So we had troops here coming through our township at those two times, but also everyone in the community was affected by the activities in the Revolutionary War. There were, there were soldiers stationed, British soldiers stationed in Kingston. There was state people stationed in Cranberry. It, was, it affected the whole community. Lastly, um, in concluding this talk, I want to talk about the transportation influence on South Brunswick's development. The first half was more or less about our agricultural background and now transportation. It was sort of, I call it, transportation transformation between 1800 and 1900. 
The first major event was the construction of the New Brunswick Trenton Turnpike, or Trenton, New Brunswick, I'm not, or New Brunswick Trenton. I, don't, I guess it depends on well, your point of view. It was started around 1804. Um, it operated as a private turnpike for about 100 years. There were tolls, places along the road, and there were, it, it was built at a time when the roads were in pretty poor condition. And um, there was the, t the state, the, t the communities, they didn't have funds to build roads. And so this, there was a, like a turnpike craze that hit the country uh, at this time, early, early 1800s. And there was over 50 of them commissioned all over the state of New Jersey. So this was our part of that turnpike craze. And as I would like to emphasize, people were always trying to see how fast they could get between New York and Philadelphia. So the better you could build a road, the faster they could get there. The next event was the Delaware and Warren Canal. This was started in 1830 in Kingston and completed in 1834. The canal was designed basically for heavy freight because about the time the canals became a popular event, the railroads were starting to come along. They, they figured out how to do this. They first started in England and brought the concept over to the United States. So the canal in 1834 and then the Camden and Amboy trains built a train line from Trenton, Princeton, and Kingston. And then it, it went from Kingston along this route here. And then, and the, well, excuse me, it went along this route, actually, and then went up to Dean's first. And that was completed in 1839 to New Brunswick. Later on, about 1863 to 1865, it was decided to straighten the tracks. So the tracks were straightened. It's more like what you know today. The tracks were straightened from Dean's Pond south to Trenton. And about the same time, Ruth told you the story about the train coming in to Dayton and, and destroying the school over there. That was called the Freehold Jamesburg Agricultural Railroad. And that was completed also about uh, 1863 to 65. And they all came together in this one little point. And this point was Monmouth Junction. So Monmouth Junction is basically here because it's a, it's a railroad town. We might not think of it today, but it was a very hub of a great deal of activity. And the last thing that occurred, transportation-wise, with rails at least, uh, so far, was the trolley built around 1900. People were still trying to get from one place to the other as quickly and as economically as they could. And so the trolley was another fad that came around 1900. The trolley's networks were all over most metropolitan areas. And this enabled people to go from Trenton to New Milltown, New Brunswick, on up to Elizabeth, even to New York City. And I'm just going to, to backtrack just a little bit when we talk about those roads. The, uh, the conveyances on that turnpike and along the, the early travel roads between New York and Philadelphia started out with vehicles that looked somewhat about like that. Not too comfortable, I guess. And this is a stage that was, that was later developed. But this didn't come in for much until like the last part of the 1700s. So these, these little wagons were the... the uh, the main event. I'd like to read you a quote here, um, which I'm not finding. A man, this is written in 1818. A man says, after riding a Jersey wagon through so much mud as I have never seen before, up to the stocks of the wheels, and yet a pair of horses dragged us in five hours from Trenton to New Brunswick. The best horses and driver and the worst roads. <laughs> Mud was a constant problem. And then getting back to the to the turnpike. This is this was a map I got from the uh, Library of Congress um, that shows the turnpike as it goes through, through our area. So, so here's uh, Kingston, and then there's this ridge road going out this way, and 
you can see that this is really a nice straight road. So they must have made pretty good time on that road. And then I'm going to show you again the picture that uh, Ruth brought of the, uh, what the roads look like. This is down near Harrison Street, uh, FMC. Uh, the, this is Route 1. <laughs> so when we, we think about what travel conditions used to be like and the dirt roads that they're talking about, it was, it was just an, an, an era that it's really hard for us, I think, to understand. And then, as we have the canal area, I would like to just show you this map of the, uh, the Delaware Raritan Canal. So here's New Brunswick. It's coming down here. We have Kingston, which is lock number eight. Then we have um, Trenton. And then this is what's called the feeder canal along the Delaware River. A lot of the canal, as I said, was for heavy freight. And the canal had a, a way of the, taking goods across the Delaware River that would come down from the coal fields in Pennsylvania, come down their canal, cross the river around Lambertville, come down this uh, feeder canal, and then up to Trenton, up through here, and up to New York. And I'm sure when we have, the, when they have that uh, Kingston presentation, you'll learn a lot more about the canals. But this is just a picture of the lock tender's house as it was about 100 years ago in Kingston. And it's now um, under the supervision of the Kingston Historical Society. And then I have this little composite here of some of the rail stations in, uh, in South Brunswick. It's kind of a composite picture. This is the Monmouth Junction Station. This is the uh, Dayton Station. This is another section of what Monmouth Junction area looked like. This is the Kingston Station. And here we have again um, Monmouth Junction. The big station was on, the, was on the northbound side, and the little one was on the southbound side, as far as I have come to understand. Every village had a station, even Dean's. I don't have a picture of the Dean's Station here, but I think the Dean's is interesting because it got its name because of the railroad station. At the time when the, it was first developed, not, not first developed, but in the 1850s, when it, the railroad came through, it was called Martinsville. And we have early maps which show it as Martinsville. But the trains felt that that name was too long. So there was a couple of families there. The Dean's family was big, also the McDowell family. And they had a competition to, to see which name was chosen. But actually, the, uh, the train company decided the Dean Station was a much smaller, shorter name. And that's what it became later shortened to Dean's. And along, the, of course, around these train stations, they had hay presses. People could bring their products. The railroads really had a big impact, and the canal, too, on the, on the businesses and, of, and the, of our community. So that they had an outlet for their farm products for the markets of New York City and Philadelphia. They also had a way to, tr to get to those places easily, and they also had aided them in bringing things back to South Brunswick. And someone was just telling me now, I don't know whether you know about it, but uh, Sears Robux had a, a catalog where you could buy a house and have it delivered. She was just telling me there's one in Dayton, and I believe there are several in Kingston. And they probably came by rail, or they might have come by the canal in, in Kingston, but definitely by rail in Dayton. And then, this is a picture of a trolley um, along Crossing Ridge Road. Now, the trolley started around 1900, and they, they were over with in the mid-1920s. I don't know what the early trolleys looked like, if they were any fancier than this or not. But I believe this was what it, it one looked like in the, the latter part of that usage. It, it was a wonderful thing for the people in the eastern part of the township, because now they could go to Trenton, New Brunswick. They could go all over just on the trolley. And so there were stops at Friendship Road. If you've been to Liberty Mall, and you oh, when the, when the, uh, the trolley's finished, PSE and G bought the track, the line. And that's where there's electric lines going through there. So if you go to Liberty Mall, you'll see these big um, electric towers. They go straight through the township all along this trolley line. 
And one of the neat things it did is it brought people out into these uh, New Jersey rural areas like South Brunswick along Davidson's Mill Road, and they built a number of cottages. And I believe at that time, Davidson's Mill Road might have been called Cottage Mill Road. And it was also significant in our recent history when we had the uh, rabbi, Grand Rabbi Shalomo Halberstam was buried here. He was buried here because when the trolley was, was around, cheap lands in South Brunswick became a place that they could build a cemetery and they could get here from New York on the trolley. Well, well, unfortunately, the trolley ended, but they still had the cemetery. And we often wonder why things happen a certain way, and that's the link in that story. I just have two more views here. We kind of come full circle with this view. I don't know how many of you have actually seen this place in South Brunswick, but it was on Route 1, on Stout, just north of Stout's Lane. And I, I say that we're coming full circle because the inns, that were sort of the, the locus of many of the villages around were for travelers and their conveyances. And now we have the new inns for the new conveyances mm -hmm. that were built along our roads today. It burnt down, but it, it like so many things in South Brunswick, it was gone, but it's still remembered by these images that we have. And the last thing is I wanted you to take away this idea about South Brunswick's growth by seeing its population change. I'm st starting in 1790, we had about 1,800, 2,000 people. And you can see the numbers, 2,000, 3,000. Still, this just stays around two or 3,000. I thought that was quite interesting. And even though Cranberry was broken off in 1870, uh, 1872 and um, Plainsboro, 1819, it still hovered about that amount of people. We get a slight jump here to 4,000. But then you see what happens between 1950 and 1960. That was when Kendall Park came. And when you think that Kendall Park came in around 1957, I believe it was when people first started moving in in 58. Three years. I had imagined a lot of those people came, 6,000 practically, in those three years. And so it made a huge impact on the community. It's, it's a seminal event, shall we say. And then we've just kind of made a gradual movement up to 37,000 people today. So there have been many changes. And we'll cover those changes when we see the, the stories of the individual communities like Kingston and Monmouth Junction and Dayton Dean. You'll see how things changed from the early days until, until we have today. And then our final presentation um, on Kendall Park, we'll emphasize the emphasis of Kendall Park and some of the other developments that have made South Brunswick what it is today. Thank you very much for coming. I'll say good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and I'll also invite you to come back and join us on April 8th when we will be doing the presentation on Kingston. It promises to be most interesting, and come and see for yourself. Thank you very much for coming.